Hey, if you're over 50, you're getting close to this. This is the big R, right? Hey, you might already be retired, which is awesome. But it's also scary because now you got to manage all your assets. And it's very easy for you to waste tens of thousands of dollars on fees you don't need to pay. And that's what we're going to talk about on today's episode. Welcome to Roger That. My name is Roger Whitney. I am the host of the Retirement Answer Man podcast and an advisor that has walked the journey into retirement with countless clients over 27 years. Hey, retirement's all we do. Now, how could you be wasting at all this money, right? Basically, because of this. A little paint-by-numbers puppy dog. I'll explain that in a second. So, if you have an IRA rollover or a 401k rollover or you're managing your own assets, either with an advisor or online, you're probably going to do this. You're probably going to fill out a risk tolerance questionnaire that is going to create an asset allocation pie chart, right? It's going to look something like this. It's going to look like that. It's going to have pretty colors and it's going to say you should have so much in all these different asset classes like fixed income and small cap stocks, large cap stocks, international. Because that is the best practice of the industry, right? Makes sense, totally. Now, why is that? Why do we even do asset allocation? Well, it's been the quote unquote best practice for investment management for about 50 years now. And one of the big reasons is that the Brinson Hood Bebauer study said asset allocation accounts for about 91.5% of potential investment performance. And then next up is security selection, which is about 4.6%. Now that study solidified asset allocation as, hey, this is the important question here. How, what does our pie chart look like from a risk reward standpoint? And that study has been replicated uh, about three or four times, I believe. So that is why we do asset allocation. Now, when you have your pie chart, right, when you have your asset allocation that you've developed online or you've worked with an advisor to do, now you have to fill those pieces of the pie, right? So if we're supposed to have, say, 30% in large U.S. stocks, we have to figure out how do we do that? And this gets to that active-passive debate, right? Right? So a passive investment is typically something that replicates the index. So let's say the S&P 500, which is an index of large company stocks in the United States. So you can't buy the index, just FYI, you can't buy the index because it's just a computer model. But you can buy a mutual fund or an ETF that will replicate the index and try to be as close to it as possible. And they're actually very inexpensive. They can be like 10 basis points. What's a basis point? Well, that's like one-tenth of 1%, one which is not much money. Now, another way of implementing, say, large cap company in your portfolio, in your asset allocation, is to hire an investment manager. So it could be a mutual fund that invests in large company stocks and compares itself to the S&P 500. Now, most active managers charge around 1.1%. So about 1% a year. That's 1% a year more than the passive strategy where it's just following a computer model. Well, that's a lot of money, right? If you have a million dollars, that could be $10,000 every single year. So the idea is, well, if I'm going to pay the extra money, I mean, I'm not... I'm not opposed to paying extra money if I'm getting value from it. But in this case, most of us get sold on the sizzle of active management. They're doing all this analysis on individual stocks and securities to buy the best portfolio, Mr. Jones, for you. But here's the problem. And this is one major reason beyond cost why most active managers don't perform as well as the more passive investment. One is cost, but the other is they're shackled to the index that they're following. In this case, we'll say the S&P 500. They basically are creating portfolios that look like this paint by numbers approach. And you're paying money for it. Now, this is a pretty little picture of a dog, but you're probably not going to pay 
a huge amount of money for it because you could replicate it yourself. I printed this off of the internet, right? Not that difficult. Well, when you hire, say, a large company manager that for that piece of the asset allocation pie, most of us don't realize this. A lot of advisors don't realize this, that by mandate, that active manager, his goal is not to make you money. That's not his number one goal. His number one goal is to outperform the index he's being compared against, meaning in this case, the S&P 500. We'll just use that one as an example. So if they don't like being in the market, they can't just go to cash, typically. By mandate, it says they have to be fully invested because that's what they were hired to do. And so when they're implementing, say, large cap stock portfolio, they're going to follow the S&P 500. And the majority of managers that do that, they get tied to that index to only focus on investment selection, right? What companies they own. But it's worse. Here's the deal. Look, so this is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is divided into sectors, right? You got the financial sector, which is about, what, uh, 15%. You have the technology sector, which is about 23%. So what happens when you hire this active manager? You pay all that extra money. What happens if they don't like financial stocks, right? Well, the sector has about 14.5% in financial stocks. So if you own a passive investment that's just mimicking the index, it's always going to be right there, right? Because it's passive. So you would think an active manager is only going to buy companies that they think are really good value. But the secret is most active managers buy mandate, meaning that the rules that are set for them are pretty clear, is most of them, if they don't like financial stocks, and financial stocks are 14.5% of the index, they can own down to, say, 12.5% in financials. Or if they really, really like financials, they can own 16 or 17% financials. So because of the way most active managers are structured in that they compare themselves to an index, they end up looking like this, and they can only play around the lines and not actually be active. They basically are what we call closet indexers, meaning that they're so restricted in the rules of the investment company because they don't want to deviate too much from the index that they don't have a chance of adding any value or very little value because they're only playing in investment selection which is, I guess, according to Brinson B. Bauer, 4.6% is security selection. But even there, they're handicapped because if they don't like a particular sector, the majority of active managers that are tied to an index can only lean slightly away from the pain or things they don't like and only slightly to things that they do like. So basically, they're playing a game of inches. But you are paying 10 times as much, potentially, in fees for someone, for an active manager that is restricted in what they can actually do, right? If you want art and you want to pay for art, this isn't art, right? This isn't worth much money. Now, this, my friend, this is art, right? This artist, my daughter, by the way, she had no paint by numbers approach. She created this based on what she was trying to accomplish. But if you're working with an advisor and everything is focused on asset allocation and you're implementing with active managers that are so restricted they can't express their art, they have to paint by numbers. Literally, you could be wasting tens of thousand dollars a year. So what's the solution? Well, I think there is value in active management only if you're hiring managers that are totally agnostic to an index and actually can create a piece of art to complement the structure of asset allocation. And 
in my world of working on successful transitions into retirement, it becomes more important to have some of that flexibility. But the key is for you as a person over 50 who wants a great life is you want to be a good steward of your assets. And if you have a certain amount of money you're willing to pay for fees, you're going to have to ask yourself a question. Do I want to pay 10 times as much for a manager that has a small lever that's really not going to make any difference in the portfolio, potentially? Or is it better to reallocate those monies you're spending on fees? Maybe you put some of it in your pocket, and maybe you spend some of that on an actual planner that can help you in the cash flow management and the net worth management, where the bigger levers levers are to have an impact on your life. So this, my friends, is a great way for you to save a lot of money and potentially put yourself in position to not just have a great retirement, but have a great life. Now, my question for you is, do you use active management? Does your advisor use active management? And have you walked through this decision analysis to make sure you're actually getting the value that you want? I would love to hear your comments below. Until next week, this is Roger Whitney. Roger that.